Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 349th episode, it's going to be a little bit shorter, I think, depending on how long my rambling fun fact goes. <laughs> but next week we have a really long episode. It's all about hadrosaurs. It's got a great interview in it. It's going to have some paleopathologies and a whole slew of all sorts of phylogenetic the lumpings and the splittings. Yes. <laughs> That's what Sabrina's going to go through. How many pages did you say that started out as? We've got about 20 or 30 pages of notes to get through. <laughs> and I think you said you whittled that down from an earlier draft that was like 40 or 50 or 60, right? I'm still whittling. <laughs> <laughs> but in this episode, we have a bunch of dinosaur news and we have dinosaur of the day, Pegomastax, or maybe Pegomastax. If you're not from Wisconsin with the nasally A's that I do. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into all of that, really quickly, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have a new patron to thank. So thank you very much to Lawrence for joining the group of dinosaur enthusiasts that make this podcast possible. And also thank you to our nine randomly selected Patreon shout out winners <laughs> this week who are Chris Ashley the Acrocanthosaurus, the Georges family, Ellen, Lucas and Eli, Sorian Brandy, Taya, Jackson Crawford, and Microraptor. And I just want to say, I often want to call Microraptor Microraptor these days after Microraptor joined <laughs> and started getting shout outs. That's a good one. I love the dinosaur inspired names. Yeah, the dinosaur-inspired names are great, but of course we love all our patrons, so thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate you. And yes, I, I don't mean to say that only the dinosaur-inspired names <laughs> are Patreon supporters that I appreciate. I appreciate everybody. They just don't get stuck in my head quite as much. <laughs> so if you want to join our growing community and hang out on the Discord, chat with other dinosaur enthusiasts, then go to our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into the news this week, we have a new paper by Femke Halwerda and others published in Geodiversitas, which is a publication I don't remember seeing before, but that could just be that I have a bad memory. It's all a redescription of Patagosaurus, which hasn't been a dinosaur of the day. I was a little surprised about that. It was named in 1979 by Jose Bonaparte. Can you guess where it's from based on that? Patagonia? Yep. He seems to have named about half of the dinosaurs from Patagonia, especially in the last century. That's what I like to refer to the 1900s as now. It's the last century. It is, <laughs> but it makes us sound old. It does, because we were born in the last century, mm -hmm. before the turn of the century, one <laughs> might say. <laughs> so Patagosaurus is considered a close relative of Cediosaurus, also known as the whale lizard, which was a dinosaur of the day very recently. So thank you for doing that because it made my research easier. Oh, good. <laughs> good. I could help. <laughs> yeah. So summarizing what you already told me, Cediosaurus is known from Europe, but Patagosaurus is known from Argentina, specifically Patagonia, as you guessed from Patagosaurus. Not too surprising since they're from the Middle Jurassic and travel was still relatively easy between the continents. So that's how you can have a close relative in those places and not be shocked about it. Cediosaurus is a pretty typical eusauropod. It's a big herbivore with four legs. It doesn't have a particularly long neck or long tail, so it's not like a diplodocid or diplodocid with a really long tail or a mementosaur with a really long neck. It's just sort of a normal-looking sauropod. I think it looks kind of like Camarasaurus to my untrained eye. And it's about 16 meters or 50 feet long and weighed about 11 tons. Hmm. So that's what you went over recently. Patagosaurus it's probably in that same ballpark. They don't give any specific size or weight estimates in this paper, though. The full name of Patagosaurus is Patagosaurus Faryasi. Patagosaurus means Patagonia lizard. And Faryasi is after Ricardo Farias, who owns the land where the fossils were found, which is pretty far south in Patagonia. It's in the Chubut province, which is way down, way farther south than New Kent. It's like pretty close to the end of the continent. <laughs> <laughs> Geologically, it was found in the Cañadón Asfalto Formation, which is between 158 and 178 million years ago, which technically spans the end of the early, all of the middle, and the beginning of the late Jurassic. So it's a pretty diverse fauna if you have the entire thing, 
but the area that Patagosaurus was found in is considered to be around the late early or early middle <laughs> Jurassic. Another, I always just think about it as the boundary. So it's around that boundary between the early and middle Jurassic, which is about 175 million years ago. Late, early, early, middle. <laughs> yeah. So you you kind of work backwards in it. So like late, early means that it's in the early Jurassic, but then it's at the late part of the early Jurassic. Because like early Jurassic is like capitalized. You can think of it and then late is a description of it. Mm. I usually just try to go with how many million years ago it is because it's easy to keep the numbers straight. <laughs> Patagosaurus is mostly known from vertebrae, included in the neck, back, and tail, but it also has most of the hips and a femur. Based on the original drawings, the holotype used to have a humerus, teeth, ribs, scapula, and coracoid, but pieces of it have gone missing or are otherwise misidentified or perhaps were never even originally associated with the holotype. So some of it seems to have gotten mixed in with other Patagosaurus material, so it can't be confidently linked to the holotype. And this paper is all about redescribing the species and the genus, so they want to actually use only holotype material. They don't want to accidentally include stuff that might be from another dinosaur or even another individual. So they were very conservative on that, and if there was any question, they left it out of the description. There are also some other bones that are probably in the museum with vague labels. It's not mixed in. They're labeled, but it's just like scapula A. And we're like, what is what is scapula? It doesn't say where it's from or what the dinosaur is or anything. Like, what does scapula A mean? And then there's a couple bones like the humerus, which no one seems to remember ever being around. So hmm. it's sort of a mystery. Fortunately, though, it is enough bones that after carefully measuring and comparing the holotype to other dinosaurs... It was enough to come up with 12 diagnostic features, which is pretty good for scoring a dinosaur. In the end, Patagosaurus, as was originally determined, is a eusauropod, which is basically the group that we think of as sauropods. It's like all the big four-legged sauropods, not like prosauropods and things like that. But it has some features that are similar to neosauropodans and some features that are similar to non neosauropodans so that's a group we don't really talk about much most eusauropods are neosauropods but there is this weird basal group of eusauropods that aren't in the neosauropod it's like you find this anytime we find enough fossils there's always just like some weird little offshoot mm -hmm. in the beginning of a group so there's been a question for a long time where patagosaurus belonged was it a neosauropod or a non-neosauropod in the non-neosauropod camp, it's got a few features that make it look like a non-neosauropod. It's got unbifurcated neural spines on the neck and back vertebrae. In other words, the things that stick up out of the vertebrae, there's just one of them. It's not split into oh, two. I feel like most sauropods you've described that we've described are bifurcated. Yes. So that would be a thing that most neosauropods have, which is what most eusauropods are. So yeah, I think you're right. I think most sauropods we found do have bifurcated neural spines but not this one it also has a keel on the bottom of the neck vertebrae and it has a relatively short and wide femur which is more like a non-neosauropod and there are some other small details too but i've already used enough jargon it also has some features that are usually found in the later neosauropods so these are the yes neosauropods not the non-neosauropods it has longer neural spines on its vertebrae in the back and the base of the tail. I remember noticing that in some of, I think, Apatosaurus. You can see how it almost looks like it would have a bump or something above its hips as the neural spines get longer. Hmm. It also has more pneumaticity in the neck and back vertebrae. And that's a really common thing. You know, we talk about as dinosaurs evolved, some of them seem to get more pneumaticity in their bones. Especially the sauropods, because they want to keep things lighter. Exactly. So they're getting a little more hollow, or maybe the air sacs are getting bigger or something like that. So to be able to lift that neck. Yes. And even though this one's pretty old, at like that roughly 175 million years ago, it already has a lot of pneumatization, which seems a little weird. And it has a convex femur. I don't really know what that's about, but mm -hmm. that's something that neosauropods usually have. And lots of other details as well. I wanted to give three of each so that I could show that it's, it's pretty evenly split between the two. Phylogenetically, though, when you score everything, throw it into a computer and see where it spits it out in the family tree, it still came out right next to Cediosaurus, which was the case before this work was done. So it's almost one of those, 
not a surprise, <laughs> confirming earlier analyses sort of things. Specifically, though, it came out right next to the Rutland Cediosaurus. They put that in separately into the matrix, as opposed to just, like you mentioned, in your dinosaur of the day. The only species that's really currently considered valid is Cediosaurus oxoniensis. And Cediosaurus oxoniensis was a little bit farther away from Patagosaurus than the Rutland Cediosaurus, which they scored separately, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It makes me think maybe the Rutland Cediosaurus is going to get named a specific species. Oh, yeah, maybe eventually. Anytime there's a nickname like that. Yeah, I think it might just be a little bit too incomplete. Like there, it maybe in this case, there was enough to compare it to, but it looked like the vertebrae they were comparing it to, or the vertebra, I should say, was a little bit worn down compared to the Cediosaurus holotype. So if you're a fan of Patagosaurus, I don't know anyone who is, but <laughs> if you are, now you know it's a close relative to Cediosaurus. And on that phylogenetic tree, since Cediosaurus is in that non-neosauropod, eusauropod group, as they put it, so it's more basal than most eusauropods, that's where Patagosaurus is too. If you want to see Patagosaurus, I'm pretty sure it's on display because there are lots of pictures of it and several of them have a metal structure holding the bones in position, which makes me think they're probably holding them in position for a display. Oh, yeah. Yeah, otherwise they'd be in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. And I believe they're on display at the Museo Argentino de Ciencias Naturales Bernardino Rivadavia in Buenos Aires, because that's what the collection number is. Is that one on the map? I believe so. In other dinosaur news, in Gibbons, Alberta, Canada, Jurassic Forest got six new dinosaurs this summer. And some people, if they were nearby and the right place, right time, they would have seen them being transported via helicopter. There's some pictures of the Spinosaurus being transported in a <laughs> helicopter. And it kind of reminds me of images from Jurassic World with the, uh, I think it was the Ehrlichsaurus. Oh, yeah. When they were moving all of them off on Fallen Kingdom, when mm -hmm. they were getting them all off the island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You don't usually see the sculptures or replicas being transported by helicopter. Well, this one's pretty heavy, and I think Jurassic Forest is pretty big. Like the Spinosaurus, it's about 49 feet, 15 meters long, and weighs about 3,000 pounds or 1,400 kilos. That is pretty heavy. Yeah. I guess I could see it if it's, as the name implies, it's in a forest, so they might want to not want to build a big road to go over to it. So if you want it to look more natural in the setting, mm -hmm. if you could plop it down with a helicopter, that would help. One of the new dinosaurs that they got, in addition to Spinosaurus, is Therizinosaurus. Nice. Yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I only saw pictures for the Spinosaurus, though. In Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Wally, the Stegosaurus, it's 1,200 pounds of fiberglass, came back to the Berkshire Museum after getting restored. So Wally's been away for about a year, been restored, the cracks were repaired, got new paint. Apparently, a lot of people have been asking, where's Wally? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they should paint, uh, or maybe they should put Wally in a red and white striped shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then have people find out where Wally is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And don't forget the hat, the beanie. <laughs> so quick recap. I'm pretty sure we've talked about Wally before, but Wally was made more than 50 years ago in New York. Came to that museum in 1997 after 30 years at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Wally was transported to New York for the restoration. Apparently the museum, the Berkshire Museum, tracked his whereabouts so people could catch a glimpse while he was on the road. And they had Wally wearing a mask. Mm. <laughs> so really easy to spot. And Wally got its name because there was a naming contest. The name Wally won. And that's because Stegosaurus has a brain the size of a walnut. Oh, so it's sort of a burn. A little bit. But I'm <laughs> sure now it's all affectionate. <laughs> The museum, the Berkshire Museum, also had some renovations. Their whole second floor has upgraded galleries, new exhibitions, and two flexible learning spaces. I'm hearing a lot about flexible learning spaces lately. What does that mean? I think it means you can easily move things around depending on what your activities you're trying to do. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. So all that's going to be unveiled August 6th. Garrett, do you remember Lily? She's the four-year-old who found this really cool dinosaur footprint. In the Vale of Glamorgan in Wales? I Now that you described exactly who she is, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's a lot nicer than the way I ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the footprint she found 
we talked about this before. It's on display at the National Museum, Cardiff. She found it while she was on a walk looking for shells, which is a great walk. But this fossil is also one of the best preserved of its type from anywhere in the UK. It's from an herbivorous dinosaur from the late Triassic. This print's about four inches or 10 centimeters. And the pictures of it, it's a really clear print. It's really easy to see the details. And to me, it looks kind of like art. Oh, nice. Lily's mom, when she saw it, at first thought that an artist had scratched it onto rocks. (laughs) That's how good it is. (laughs) That's really good because a lot of times dinosaur tracks are like, I need a paleontologist to outline where it is. And then I'm like, oh, I guess that's a track. I'm still not sure if I believe it. But then other times they can be really fantastic. Yeah. So they're thinking this was from a bipedal dinosaur that was about eight feet, two and a half meters long. And for those in Wales, it's on display at the museum. And then the exhibit's called Lily's Fossil Footprint. So it's named after her. Nice. I'm just going to get into it. There's a couple of good fossil finds by various kids and students. So I'm just going in order of age. The next one is <laughs> in South Dakota, a 10-year-old. Mila helped find fossils for what might be the most complete known triceratops specimen. We don't know yet because they're not done excavating and preparing. But she worked with Westminster College and David Schmidt. And the team is calling this specimen Shady the Triceratops. So Mila will be with the team again next summer helping to excavate. It'd be cool to hear the details when they finish. Yeah. We don't have a lot of really complete Triceratops, so that will be very interesting. Probably add to that debate, too. About it and Taurosaurus? Mm-hmm. Yeah, someone was just asking in our Discord, like, why can't we tell the difference at this point, especially by using some of the bones that aren't the skull? You know, like maybe there's something unique in that body (laughs) that Mm -hmm. we could use that's different consistently between Taurosaurus and Triceratops. So maybe this could help with that. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there's a few Ceratopsian specimens that have been found recently that just need to be prepared and analyzed. Yeah, isn't the dueling dinosaurs in there? Isn't the Triceratops one of the duelers? Oh, I thought with dueling dinosaurs, that was going to add to the debate between Tyrannosaurus and Nanotyrannus. Well, it's got both. Oh, okay. I think it's a Triceratops and a Tyrannosaur. <laughs> <laughs> It'll either add to the debate or maybe it's double settle a debate oh, if we get lucky. I was thinking about some other news items we covered that I think it was Colorado. Where mm-hmm. They're saying they found Taurosaur specimens. Mm. Yep. So we'll just have to wait and see. So the next find was by a college student. This was in Montana. It was a student from Chapman University, Sarah. She went on a dig with Jack Horner and a team from Oklahoma State University. And it was part of Horner's course from Chapman called Dinosaurs in Science and Media. And at the end of the semester, all the students are invited to the Badlands to go on a dig. (laughs) That's funny. I was like, dinosaurs in science and media, and they're starting out near L.A., but they go to Montana. There's not a lot of dinosaurs and science and media out there. There's dinosaurs, though. <laughs> there are, Way more dinosaurs than in L.A. That's true. <laughs> or near L.A. It's not quite L.A. Anyway, while on the dig, Sarah said she had a dream that she would find a big fossil. And then the next day, she did find a really big fossil. So she calls this fossil the dream bone. <laughs> not because it's especially good, but just because she had a dream about it. Well, Apparently, it is a good find because, I mean, it's big. It's an ilium. It's about three feet long or almost a meter long. And it might belong to a gryposaurus, a hadrosaur. That's a cool one. We've got a list from Screen Rant of all the confirmed and rumored dinosaurs that are appearing in Jurassic World Dominion. But when I was going through the list, the list seemed pretty short. So they said it includes T-Rex, because obviously you've got Rexy. There's Velociraptor, because blue. Then they said Gallimimus, Compsognathus, so I'm glad to see the Compies are back, Mm -hmm. and Kylosaurus, Allosaurus, Nasutoceratops. That makes sense, because that was the one that battled Big Rock, right? I thought that might have been Sinoceratops. Was it Nasutoceratops? That was Nasutoceratops. Oh, cool. So yeah, we got to see what happens after Big Rock, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then there's the new dinosaurs. We got the Dromaeosaurid Atrociraptor. And then the dinosaurs that we saw in the preview, it's a bit of a spoiler. I'm just going to list the dinosaurs. (laughs) I mean, you've been doing that, but yeah. (laughs) But it's Dreadnoughtus, Iguanodon, Moros, Oviraptor, and Giganotosaurus. I didn't realize that in the preview it was supposed to be Dreadnoughtus. That's interesting. Or Moros for that 
matter. Oh, I did because I read about it beforehand. Oh, yeah. I did edit that, so no. <laughs> I should remember. But that was a lot of dinosaurs to keep track of. They're saying that the rumored dinosaurs could be Dilophosaurus, Triceratops, and Spinosaurus. So bringing back, it would make sense to have all of them because they're saying this is kind of bringing everything back and they're bringing back a lot of characters from the first mm, three films. Yeah. Why not the dinosaurs from the first three? Too bad they can't bring back Nedry. I know. <laughs> Him and Dilophosaurus for a reprise. <laughs> but you know what dinosaur is missing? Brachiosaurus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you didn't list a... It was only Dreadnoughtus in the sauropods, right? Yeah. Well, they kind of killed off the Brachiosaurus in the last one and made a big deal about that. Yeah, but they showed sauropods in that room before Maisie let them all out. It's true. I think there were sauropods in there, right? Oh, yeah, there were sauropods. Yeah, I would be surprised if there wasn't a Triceratops, too, because I'm pretty sure there's been a Triceratops in every movie as well. Or at least, a, well, yeah, there's been a Ceratopsian. Well, there might not have been a Triceratops yeah, specifically in Fallen Kingdom. Ceratopsian, yeah. Anyway, that's why I was thinking the list seems incomplete, a bit short, both in terms of dinosaurs, and also they have the shorter dinosaurs. Where are the sauropods? <laughs> yeah, where are they in Kylosaurus? Oh, there was ankylosaurus. It was in Ankylosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> but where are the other Ankylosaurus? <laughs> Greedy. <laughs> yeah. I only ever get the one Ankylosaurus. Oh, maybe that tells you something about the popularity of sauropods versus ankylosaurs. No, it tells me <laughs> nothing. It's it tells, just a coincidence. It tells me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> we've got a Kickstarter story. And I should mention, we stopped covering Kickstarter a while back when we were getting tons of requests because there was a brief period there where it seemed like everyone was doing a Kickstarter about dinosaurs and we were just getting, it would have been like all of our news every week. But things seem to have settled down, so we're going to go back to covering them again. So if you find out about a Kickstarter, you can let us know. Plus, I thought it just seemed wrong to cover launches of established brands, but not independent creators, because we really like the dinosaur scene and how like anybody gets into dinosaurs and there's so much you can do with them. Mm -hmm. And I realized we were like covering all these like big brands of things, and then we wouldn't cover Kickstarter. It just it felt wrong. Yeah. So we're back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we get inundated with requests, then we'll have to be a little picky. We might have to, but yeah, the plan is to go ahead with yeah. Kickstarters again. So there's a new dinosaur comic on Kickstarter, and it's called Cenovore. And I think that name comes from the, quote, giant evil skeletal T-Rex known as Cena. <laughs> nice. It's quite a name then. But it's spelled like S-I-N-A, not like John Cena, which is mm. apparently C-E-N-A. Hmm. The story is about a boy from the 21st century who gets mysteriously teleported to the Cretaceous. So that's your sort of That's setup. how you get to the dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah. That's always the question is like, how how are the dinosaurs and the humans going to interact in this? So this one's just a mystery. They don't waste any time on it. Just mysteriously teleported. Boom. Yep. Now you got to deal with T-Rex. <laughs> exactly. So there's been a couple pages created so far for the fundraising. There's a pachycephalosaur that runs over for a cuddle. Oh. But at first the boy thinks he's, you know, going to get like impaled. Or... Sure, it's a giant. It's giant compared to a human boy. <laughs> yes. Like bat battering rammed or something. But it, it was just looking for a place to hide from something scary. And then there's, like I said, the giant evil skeletal T-Rex. And I guess it's all about this boy and how he survives in the Cretaceous when he just randomly showed up there, which would be a difficult thing to do. Hopefully he has some dinosaur friends to help about. So this should be up on Kickstarter now, and it costs two pounds, including UK shipping. So it's pretty cheap. Sounds like a cool comic. And now onto the dinosaur of the day, Pegomastix, which was a request from Elrex via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a heterodontosaurid that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now South Africa in the Elliott Formation. And when you think of Pegomastix, think of a two-legged, small kind of fuzzy, bristly dinosaur with a beak and fangs. It was estimated to be about 24 inches or 60 centimeters long, and the skull length is pretty small. It's around 2.7 to 3 inches or 70 to 80 millimeters long. A lot of articles describing Pegomastix said that it weighed no more than a house cat. So like a, a house cat's weight, but longer and more lanky and covered in bristles rather than soft fur. Yeah. And, and fangs. And a beak. Right. <laughs> Seems pretty awful compared to a cat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So like I said, it has this robust lower jaw and then a short parrot-shaped beak. We got a lot of different animal descriptions going on in here. Yeah, that's quite an amalgamation there. I think other other articles called it like Dracula-like too. So got all kinds of stuff. I've seen pictures of it. It is not a cute animal. Yeah, yeah. Dracula dinosaur. Because it had these large canine-like teeth, the fangs, in the front of the jaws, the upper and lower. And those fangs, they might have been for defense or interspecies combat or display or maybe to help dig up plants. Eh, like a boar digging for truffles? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so Pagomastix was probably herbivorous, despite the fangs, though some scientists think that heterodontosaurids ate insects and small lizards, so there's some debate. The fossils were described in 2012 by Paul Serino, but he said he noticed that they were unique back in 1983 and that he was embarrassed how long it took him to study them. <laughs> he had a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah. So he named Pegomastex in a paper about heterodontosaurids. And he said that extensive toothware suggests that heterodontosaurids were either mostly or fully herbivorous. Also, the way that their teeth meet when biting shows that it's sheared, which it was a sophisticated way at the time for processing plant material. He said that toothware and heterodontosaur cheek teeth are usually very well developed. And that Pegomastix had a nearly continuous wear surface in the larger cheek teeth. And this parrot-like skull may have helped it pluck fruit. Also, as a side note, Pegomastix probably had 11 dentary teeth and it replaced its teeth regularly. The type species is Pegomastix africana. The genus name means strong jaw in Greek. It was originally named Pegomastix africanus, but the word africanus is masculine and the word mastex is feminine, so to be grammatically correct, it was changed to Pegomastix africana. And the species name means pertaining to Africa. The holotype of Pegomastix is a partial skull, both dentaries and a predentary, this toothless beak-like bone. It was found in a small block of sandstone matrix. Serena first saw the fossils at Harvard, but then eventually they were returned to the South African Museum in Cape Town. The body of Pegomastix was probably covered in bristles, so maybe it looked porcupine-ish, just to add to the list of animals and other things this dinosaur looked like. <laughs> there were bristles found all over the body of Tianyuong, which is a heterodontosaur around the same size that was found in China. That one was preserved by volcanic ash, so very well preserved. So that, that's why we assume, based on its close relative, that this one probably had those same... Bristles, porcupine-like yeah. things. Yes, exactly. And Pegomastix appears in Ark Survival Evolved. Which you can play on our server, if you're a patron. And our fun fact of the day is an answer to a question that I've been wondering for a while, probably since I was a small child, actually. <laughs> But a discussion on our Discord by Venezoic, Crow, and Tyrant King finally got me to investigate enough to put together a real fun fact. And that is? What dinosaurs could people ride? That explains why you pulled out the Dinotopia books. <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually, I think Dinotopia might have been the very first thing that got me interested in dinosaurs. Because it came out around the same time as Jurassic Park, but I was too young to be able to go see Jurassic Park. Mm. So I think Dinotopia, because that was my favorite book for many years. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of riding dinosaurs that happens in that sort of magical land with dinosaurs and people. That's probably why you've been pondering this question so long. I think so, yeah. So... What I broke it down into is three categories that you want in a rideable animal. Okay. So they have to be physically strong enough to carry you. Sure. They have to be the right temperament that they're willing to carry you. Right, they won't buck you off. Yes. And sort of related to that is they have to be stable enough that it's practical for you to ride them. Right, you want to be semi-comfortable. Yes. And sort of like you were saying with getting bucked off, mm -hmm. they have to have a gait that's sort of matches with riding well that rules out ankylosaurs why <laughs> they're too spiky maybe 
But if you have a saddle, that might be okay. Oh, okay. I did debate with that. It, and there are different ankylosaurs because some of them do have like spikier osteoderms, but other ones have like flatter ones. Like Euoplocephalus <laughs> isn't quite as spiky as some of the others. <laughs> Until it touched a nerve by how you said why. <laughs> I was just wondering out of those three categories what you thought. I was thinking maybe you were thinking temperament, like it's going to club you or something. No, I think it would be okay as long as it knew you weren't a threat. Yeah, but it's certainly strong enough and stable enough mm -hmm. to ride. So in those ways, it'd be good. And I did see that there are videos and there is a tortoise that you can ride somewhere. Oh my God. They let kids ride a tortoise and tortoises are pretty ankylosaur-like. They so. let kids ride the tortoise. I think a human, they don't have the physical strength for an adult human yeah. to ride it. They don't want to hurt the, the tortoise since you're sitting on their ribs. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone should ride a tortoise, but that's a different story. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm going to go through the different categories. So for physical strength, I want to start with modern birds for each of these because that's obviously the best analog that we have for dinosaurs and mm -hmm. riding them. So ostriches are a thing that people ride. Yeah. Oh, man. The videos of that. It's crazy. I wouldn't have pegged them for a stable. No. but that's, Or the right temperament. We're talking about physical strength. You're oh, jumping ahead. Right, right, right. <laughs> So ostrich riding, it's something that people do apparently mostly in South Africa. That's at least what I had read, that that's where it's still mostly popular. It's frowned upon by animal rights activists because common ostriches only weigh about 115 kilograms or about 254 pounds, and they're built for speed. Hmm. So a lot of people say you might hurt the ostrich by riding it, which I think is reasonable. They don't seem to like it very much. So it's possible. But other people do say that they're more than strong enough and it doesn't actually hurt them. So I don't know. I couldn't easily find any examples of ostriches getting hurt from riding ostriches, people riding ostriches. I did find a lot of examples of people getting hurt from trying to ride ostriches, though. I could see that because they go so fast. They do. And there isn't a good place to sit. You sort of hold on to their wings and just like hope for the best. And then it's usually in like a race format because they try to run you off, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not advised, I would say. In general, too. Ostrich riding is usually limited to people under about 150 pounds or 68 kilograms or 11 stone if you're in a place that uses stone. <laughs> That's one of my favorite ways to measure weight. I think it's kind of quaint. quaint. But except regularly used in some places, so not quaint. Yeah, It's just like, what is it, 14 pounds, but they just use stone instead. Mm. I don't know. Unfortunately or fortunately, ostriches can't support people long term and that means that you can't really ride it like you would a horse or something because mm -hmm. it's it's a really temper it's more like riding a bull something you do for a brief period of time for a laugh more or less mm -hmm. or a, a quick competition i did find some claims that emus can be ridden but i couldn't find any actual evidence of an adult on an emu i think i saw one picture of a kid maybe they weigh about half as much as an ostrich, which means most adults weigh more than an emu, which is not going to work out well for getting carried around. Mm -hmm. There are a couple people that I found online that said if you try to put any weight on their back, they just lie down because they're really <laughs> docile. <laughs> so they're just like, get off me. And they're just sort of like, we're done down. here. <laughs> yeah. Or they'd probably run away and it'd be similar to an ostrich in that way. So those are basically the only contenders for modern dinosaurs that people can ride. Basically just ostriches. But there is an issue even with the physical strength for ostriches because they're just too close to human body weight. So they're not strong enough to carry humans for long periods of time. Usually when people are looking for an animal they can ride, they want something that can go at least five miles. Usually 10, 15 is sort of the goal. And there's no way an ostrich is going to be able to hold up a person for that long. All the animals that people do regularly ride are mammals. Some of them include elephants, camels, horses, yaks, water buffalo, Mule, reindeer, donkey, and llamas. Mammals riding mammals. Yep. <laughs> it reminds me of that monkey riding a deer in Japan thing mm -hmm. that happens. So usually, the way you figure out if an animal can be ridden from a strength perspective is using the 20% rule. Basically, you take the weight of the animal, you multiply it by 20%, and that's how much they can carry. So the lightest animal on that list I just read out is the llama. A llama weighs on average about 400 pounds. That actually might be on the heavier side or about 180 kilograms. And that means they could carry about 80 pounds or 36 kilograms, which is why you see llamas in like petting zoos and you can put a kid on a llama to ride around in a small circle. But an adult probably isn't going to ride a llama, maybe mm -hmm. a very light adult, though. 
the thing that people do use llama for really regularly is using them as pack animals. That's usually what ends up happening with these lighter animals that don't can't support a human's weight. So you can put 80 pounds of stuff on a llama and have it follow you around, which is a lot easier to guide a llama than it is to carry 80 pounds of stuff. You can also do that with goats. There's a whole thing about pack goats that people <laughs> lead around, which I find <laughs> fascinating. And they they can't hold that much. They hold like 40 or 50 pounds. But if you have a big backpack and instead you're just going through a hike with your goat, it sounds kind of fun. Hiking with your goat. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently got popularized for people that for whatever reason can't carry a pack or maybe they're getting older and they don't want all that extra stress on their back. So then they bring a goat with them. It's just... I love it. (laughs) The same is true for most donkeys, but adults can ride large donkeys, also known as mammoth donkeys, (laughs) which is unfortunately a domesticated group, which isn't around so much anymore because most people just use mules where you crossbreed a horse and a donkey and they're already pretty big. So given that 20% rule for a 200 pound riding capacity, you're looking for an animal that weighs about a thousand pounds or half a ton. And that's a pretty typical weight for almost all of those animals that I listed that people ride. It's like they're roughly a thousand pounds. It seems to be a pretty good balance because you want them to be big enough that they can carry a person, but you don't necessarily want them to be huge like an elephant because then they're just going to be kind of slow and they have more capacity than you need. So based on the animals that can hold people, I'd say any dinosaur that's above about a half a ton could carry a person talking only about the physical strength (laughs) perspective It's possible, though, that that number is a little bit low since ostriches seem to be able to carry much more than 20% of their weight, and dinosaurs are pretty powerful pound for pound. So maybe a dinosaur down in the 500-pound range might be able to carry a 200-pound person. I don't know. Dinosaurs are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's safe to say that half a ton, but it could be a little bit lighter than that. So the next category is temperament, and I want to start this with a little story. So Johnny Cash had a sort of small zoo on his property when he was getting later in life and one of those animals was an aggressive male ostrich that he kept in like a wooded area and he would walk through this wooded area and sometimes it would charge at him or hiss at him and do all this stuff that scary big ostriches might do to you Mm -hmm. if they don't like you being near them so one time he took a walking stick with him and they said it was like a six foot stick and as it approached him he like brandished it at the ostrich and then it sort of like lunged at him so he swung the stick at it And the ostrich dodged the stick and then slashed at him with its foot. Oh, my gosh. And he credits his belt buckle for saving his life because ostriches have pretty big claws on their feet. And it basically just messed up his belt buckle rather than (laughs) disemboweling him. That's a smart ostrich. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has really good reflexes and did not appreciate being swung at. Nope. Just didn't miss a beat and came straight for him. Don't mess with dinosaurs. No. And it made me also, it reminded me immediately of Jurassic Park. Alan Grant's depiction of a velociraptor going for a human's soft abdomen with its claw, I think is a pretty good guess about what you'd need to be wary of if you were going to try to ride something Mm -hmm. like a non-avian ostrich size or smaller. So all that is to say, ostriches do not have the right temperament (laughs) to be ridden. I could have guessed that. Yes. In fact, they don't even have the right temperament to be used as pack animals, which is sort of a lower barrier than riding the animal because you don't need them to be quite as stable or when you're leading them you have a little more control over them than when you're on their back i presume but they don't like having stuff on their back and they freak out there are other modern birds that maybe could be better suited might have a better temperament i think emu are usually considered to be a tamer ratite than ostriches but again they're not strong enough so it's hard to gauge whether they have the right temperament for being ridden But emu are also roughly tied with the southern cassowary for the second largest bird. I would never (laughs) try to do anything with a cassowary. No, I couldn't find anyone foolish enough to try riding a cassowary. I did search for it just because they weigh over 100 pounds in many cases. All the videos I've seen with people and cassowaries is they've got a shield (laughs) and the cassowary is kicking at them. And they say, good thing I've got this riot gear. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny that you mention it because there are actually a couple examples of trained cassowaries that allegedly aren't dangerous. And I even found one that was basically like when someone's holding a snake in front of a crowd and there's nothing in front of them. Mm -hmm. There was a cassowary in that situation, like a fully grown adult cassowary. And they're just showing it like jump up and do tricks for food, (laughs) which is crazy to me. 
And that's when I learned, too, that cassowaries can swallow apples whole, oh my gosh. which looks crazy because their neck is like smaller in diameter than an apple. So you see this huge apple like go down their neck. Who figured that out? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I wonder if like someone was eating an apple and it like snatched it out of his hand and just swallowed <laughs> it whole. And they're like, well, that happened. <laughs> or maybe it just picked one off a tree. I don't know. It's pretty crazy. But I think even in that case, the cassowary was trained to do tricks for food, but not really domesticated in a way where you could ride it, even if you were small enough to get on it. And I don't think it's the kind of thing you would want to risk because animals that you can be around sometimes get more ornery once you climb on top of them and you don't want a cassowary to be upset with you. Mm -hmm. To that end, that is another criteria for temperament is not attacking people and I bring that up because tigers weigh more than a llama <laughs> and ligers weigh about the same as a mule, which is a, a crossbreed just like a mule. But people don't really ride them, although apparently people have ridden tigers for short distances. I've seen several pictures and Siegfried and Roy, mm. there are videos of them riding their tigers. They sort of like grab onto the shoulders and then they have like their knees sort of on the back legs. Because that ended well. Yeah, exactly. So it's not recommended. <laughs> You don't want an animal that can, you know, rip your face off as your mode of transportation. There's a good example, too, of this is there's a frequent comparison between horses and zebras because zebras are about the same size as horses and they're very close relatives. The group Equus has three groups. It's got asses, which includes donkeys, horses and zebras. Those are the three horses and donkeys can be domesticated and easily ridden. So you'd think zebras could be, but no. They definitely can't be. It's been tried many times and it mm. always ends poorly. Basically, they panic really easily. They also get very aggressive and will bite at you or kick you super hard. And they can't be easily trained, mm. which are essentially the three important elements of temperament. You want it in order to ride it. You want it to not be aggressive to the riders. You want to be able to suppress its fight and flight instincts. And you want it to be able to follow commands. And zebra will do none of those things. <laughs> so... Sometimes people try to crossbreed them with horses. There was a thing that happened with that, and it also failed. So, no. <laughs> Zebra are out. And that kind of shows you just how important temperament is that this animal that looks just like a horse but with stripes and is even super closely related is completely unsuitable for riding. <laughs> but I think there are some birds that have pretty good temperaments and can be trained, like homing pigeons, for example. So maybe if they were bigger... And maybe to that extension, larger dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs, might have a suitable temperament to be ridden. So then last but not least is stability. This one's pretty simple, but as a quick example, we've already gone over like cassowary and ostriches aren't suitable for riding. The next biggest modern dinosaur after the emu and cassowary tie for second place is the emperor penguin. But clearly, it does not have the right body shape <laughs> required for carrying people. Maybe you could hold on to its back while it's swimming, but it probably dives way deeper than you'd want to go. Yes. Actually, that's a good point because I was looking through all sorts of lists of animals that people ride, and one of them is dolphins. Mm. And that's basically the same thing. You don't really ride a dolphin. You hold on to it and it pulls you around. Mm -hmm. So maybe, yeah, you could do that with uh, an emperor penguin or, for that matter, some Maybe like a Spinosaurus even. Hold on to its sail. Ooh, I would not want to do that. I wouldn't want to either. <laughs> Actually, I, t I take that back. Don't ride a Spinosaurus. <laughs> so ideally, there would be a flat or a concave place to sit. Horses are pretty ideal. They've got sort of a concave back that you just plop right in. You don't even need a saddle if you know what you're doing. It's pretty amazing. But at a minimum, they can't have major obstructions on their back like a Stegosaurus or a Spinosaurus or an Amargosaurus. And then preferably it would have a smooth gait because if it bounces like a kangaroo or shifts too far from side to side while it's walking, it's going to be hard to ride. Fortunately, most dinosaurs we think had a pretty smooth gait. So that would be one point in the column of riding dinosaurs. And then in general, a quadrupedal animal would be a lot more stable with the weight on its back, which would allow you to sit as well in a variety of position because Basically, you can be anywhere between its legs, and it's not going to get thrown off balance. If you're riding a bipedal animal, you have to sit right above its hips to keep it balanced, mm. because otherwise it's going to have to either rear up to try to shift you back, or if you're too far back, it's going to try to lean forward to shift you forward, because otherwise it's going to fall over. That seems difficult. Yeah. I've seen a lot of depictions of bipedal animals where 
like a Parasaurolophus, for example, and somebody's sitting like up near its shoulders, it's not going to work. It's going to face plant. If you mm-hmm. sit there, you'd have to sit back by its hips, which might work, but you'd need some really long reins. And since they're bipedal, they could rear up very easily. So I think quadrupedal is probably the preference if you can. So to summarize what you're looking for, if you're going to ride a dinosaur. <laughs> a non-avian dinosaur. Yeah, not avian dinosaur. Or an avian dinosaur. You want it to weigh half a ton or more, so like a 1,000 pounds. You want it to be an herbivore or an omnivore, probably, so that it, it doesn't tear you apart. Preferably quadrupedal. You need a docile temperament that is more or less capable of domestication. I think all those things rule out the current avian dinosaurs. Yes, because, well, the half a ton alone Mm -hmm. is enough for that. Yeah. And unfortunately, you can't know about temperament from fossils. We could figure out the rest of it pretty well, but we can't figure out the temperament, which is, like I said with zebra, a really important element to this. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to figure it out from our current fossils. Maybe in the future, someone will figure out a way to figure out temperament from fossils. Maybe based on some ichno fossils, you can figure out behaviors. Yeah, maybe. Certainly, I've seen with domestication, the argument that animals that are sort of prime to follow a leader are better for domestication like dogs you know they have like a an order Mm -hmm. and so you can assume like the alpha role and sort of train them which i think is part of the deal with the herds yeah and like the herbivore versus an omnivore thing because if it's a solitary carnivore it's not going to have that sort of social structure and probably be harder to train Mm -hmm. so yeah you could probably figure that out from the fossil record but I think there's lots of medium to large ornithischians that fit the bill for the other criteria, like ceratopsians. Hadrosaurs? Yeah, maybe hadrosaurs. They're bipedal, but I think they might do. They're facultive. Yeah, some of them. It depends. Some of the really big ones, too, like maybe an Edmontosaurus. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could go on its back and maybe it would go quadrupedal for you. I don't know. I think ankylosaurs might be decent. Also, in another group, you've got sauropods are an obvious contender. They certainly wouldn't have any problem with the strength component Mm -hmm. (laughs) at the very least. I think they'd fit all of them. As long as you could control it. Like, I can't imagine putting reins on a sauropod or like how you would guide it seems very difficult with its really long neck and everything. You befriend it. (laughs) (laughs) I think that one might be an easier one to lead (laughs) than it would be to. Train it from a young age, like a hatchling. Yeah. Help it grow. It'll be your friend. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> and then I think even like a Therizinosaurus could be decent as well as a the only theropod that I would probably even remotely think of. Although with those claws, I don't know. I might not even go for that. Mm. And even Therizinosaurus, it has more of a penguin-like posture given our modern depiction. So you might slide right off its back unless you have some really clever saddle. But when I was, I was looking at all these different dinosaur silhouettes trying to figure out which one I would want to ride... I think I would go a Struthiomimus or some other really large Ornithomimosaur because I think they'd be great for higher speed as long as you could keep your balance above its hips because they're bipedal. And that also assumes that it doesn't have the temperament of its namesake ostrich and hate having you on its back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if you couldn't get that to work, I think Ceratopsians are probably the best bet as long as their backs aren't too rounded because on elephants, for example, the riders tend to sit just behind the head to sort of av- avoid the slopingness of the back. But you can't do that on a ceratopsian because you get squished by the frill if it looks up, basically. Yeah. And you can't ride on the frill. No. No. You got to stay in between the legs for sure. <laughs> Don't You can't ride on animals' heads <laughs> in general. <laughs> so, yeah. What would you... You'd go with a sauropod? Oh, yeah. No question. Which sauropod, though? Maybe a brachiosaurus. Ooh, just adding a whole other level. I could see, actually, that might be better for the reins, because maybe if you turned its head, it would make more of a difference than trying to turn the really long head Mm -hmm. that's stretched out far in front of you. Yeah, or like a giraffe a titan, too. Mm -hmm. But given their really tall height, that could make mounting and dismounting even more difficult. Oh, yeah. It's probably scary, too, when they rear up. Yeah. You'd have to, at a minimum, you'd have to train them like an elephant where they, like, take a knee so that people can climb up onto them mm-hmm. and you maybe build some kind of ladder structure oh, yeah. you would down definitely inside. need a ladder, yeah. <laughs> maybe you all can only ride juvenile sauropods. Oh, that could be, yeah. You got a short window, though, because they grow fast. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a backup plan, too, in case this problem ever arises. Okay. And that's building a dinosaur chariot or buggy <laughs> to be towed behind the animal. <laughs> because... <laughs> 
before people learned how to ride horses, that's what they did. They used the chariot instead Mm because we could, it was easier to sort of guide them in a general direction and they would tolerate being towing something rather than having it on their actual back. So that could work too. Maybe. Or use it as a pack animal. First step though, is to have a non-avian dinosaur. And so kind of out of luck. Yes, we are. (laughs) It's a fun thought experiment though. Yeah, definitely. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you want to join our growing community, chat with fellow dinosaur enthusiasts, and get a whole slew of other perks, then go to our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time.